Alrighty, so Volpius, they can see your screen on Twitch as well as here in Discord. Um, all right, uh, Strider, the floor is yours. All right, hey uh, guys, welcome to the Pathfinder character creation panel. Um, it's good. The we're gonna do this probably a little different than, or this is probably gonna be a little different than most of the other panels. Um, in that basically we'll guide you through the basic concepts of. Uh, character creation and then if you have questions uh you can use the furcon voice or if you are on twitch you can ask there and basically we will um give you answers or help and guide you through uh any questions you have whether you're making a uh, pathfinder first edition second edition rpg character or if you're going for a society legal character for pathfinder organized play or Pathfinder Society organized play. Um, so let me post up the links that I'm going to be doing here so people can follow along for first edition. Um, don't worry, Twitch, I will be posting these in a moment. Uh, it is in the Furcon voice now for people on there. And all right, Twitch has it now. So I, yeah. Oh God, I already had posted, but sure, I guess it's double posted now. Um, so the one I, that has been suggested to me that I kind of like is the character sheet UK for the Pathfinder first edition. Basically you go there, you use your Google or whatever to log in. Um, and then if you go to that second link, the legacy Aeon uh, getting started. So we'll go from top uh, to bottom here, starting with what are some common terms used in Pathfinder. Uh, first up, you have your ability scores. There are six ability scores in Pathfinder. Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma. Strength is generally good for lifting and bashing things. Dexterity is good for ranged combat and being able to dodge. Constitution dictates how much health you have. Intelligence is useful for skills, uh, as well as uh, casting uh, for some uh, classes. Wisdom is also another one of those casting stats. And then Charisma is uh, for being a diplomat, like talking to people, uh, things along that line. Uh, there's actions, which, is, you have, which are things like casting spells, making attacks, um, and there's standard action, move action, swift action, free action, full round. Basically, the main ones that you'd want to be concerned with as a low-level character would be uh, you get one standard action and one move action each turn during combat. Alignment. Uh, now, this kind of represents your basic moral and ethical attitude. Um, I wouldn't... I don't uh, tell new players to worry about that too much unless they're doing like a divine class or a class that's really alignment heavy, like paladins, for example, druids, clerics, like those are classes that you want to be, make sure you're kind of staying within your alignment and not really straying away and doing things that your uh, DD would otherwise not approve of. Uh, armor class, all... So armor class is basically how hard are you to hit? The better the AC, or the higher the AC, the better. But there are some drawbacks with that, such as like you can have high AC with um, heavy armor, but heavy armor can also hinder you in other things as well. Uh, base attack bonus. Um, basically, it represents your skill in combat. Um, generally speaking, martial classes, which are like your, you know, um, fighters, rangers, uh, other class that like classes that like to hit things, they will start with one bab uh, at first level. Um, spell casting classes will usually get a bab every other, every third level or so, uh, depending on what class you're talking. Um, bonuses. So when like I was talking about your. Um, Ability scores, uh, depending on what your ability score is, determines what your bonus is. So, like, if you have a 16 strength, that's a plus 3 to your strength-based uh, skills, or to your strength-based skills and attacks. Caster level represents your creature's, uh, creature's power and ability when casting spells. Uh, classes are 
basically kind of represent you as to as to like what kind of things your character does um a check is a d20 roll which may or may not be modified by another value uh common uses of this include attack rolls ability rolls skill checks and saving sa uh, ch saving throws combat maneuvers uh so this is uh, things in combat that don't directly hurt your opponent. Uh, the main one would be like disarming, grappling, and tripping. Um, and the next thing is the uh, modifier that really helps dictate how well you are at doing this, which is your combat maneuver bonus. Uh, the better the bonus, the easier it is for you to pull off combat maneuvers. And then on the flip side, combat maneuver defense is how hard it is for somebody to do combat maneuvers against you. Uh, concentration check um, it's more of a caster thing of if someone disrupts you during uh, your casting you have to basically concentrate otherwise you basically get distracted like imagine like you trying to cast a spell and somebody's you know hits you with a sword obviously you can go ow but saying ow might interrupt your spell so um, imagine it kind of that way a creature is uh, Basically, any kind of um, active participant includes PCs, NPCs, and monsters. Um, this one's a little bit advanced, as, or well, a little bit like further down the line, but uh, damage reduction. There's some things that might have um, damage reduction where you know you won't do full damage to it unless you have a certain thing that um, counters it. So like. Um, one example would be fire elementals are vulnerable to cold. So if you were, you know, if they were to have like a, a damage reduction, or if they were to have like a, or, well, I guess that's a bad example. Um, what's a good one? Um, what is it that's cold iron? I don't remember what um, specific monster it is. That, Demons. Huh? Demons. Demons. Demons yeah. are vulnerable. Yeah, demons are vulnerable to cold iron. So if you're using a cold iron weapon, basically you're avoiding, uh, you basically get to ignore that DR and do full damage. Um, difficulty class. So basically when there's rolls that need to be made, uh, there will be a certain um, difficulty that you need to succeed at. Um, this is usually determined by the skill or by the GM. Um, and then next we go into uh, extraordinary abilities. Um, usually uh, these are unusual abilities that don't rely on magic to function. Uh, these can be things earned from your class skill or from class, from race or other things. <laughs> and then you have XP, which um, I mean, I'm sure most people here played games where you have some kind of um, XP bar or something where obviously the more you get, the the closer you get to leveling up and then you when you level you get you know new thing you get more things basically and then feats are something that uh normally you get a feat uh first level third level fifth level seventh level basically every other level you will have an additional feat that you gain um but it's like um a different things that allow you to do cool things um as volpus kind of uh, decided i think yesterday or the day before uh, one of his sayings is going to be, there's a feat for that. Uh, next up, you have the GM, which is the Game Master. I know um, for Dungeon and Dragons, people call it Dungeon Masters, but for Pathfinder, it's gen uh, Pathfinder and Starfinder, uh, is the, it's generally regarded as the Game Master. Basically, it's the person who controls the story, the one running things. Uh, next up, you have Hit Die, which is your general level of power and skill as far as like what dictates your hit points, which is your life. Next up, we have initiative. Uh, when combat begins, uh, and everyone rolls initiative. Basically, think of initiative as, you know, how quickly you're able to react to the situation. Basically, the characters who are able to, you know, be quicker at, you know, reacting to combat starting get to go first and then the characters who are a little slower to react will be you know later in in the uh initiative but it also depends on what you roll on the d20 i've seen people with good modifiers for initiative roll pretty crap on that uh 
and I've had times where me as the uh, cleric, which is usually regarded as, you know, you usually want the cleric, you know, usually the cleric is the regard as the class that goes last in the initiative because usually they have pretty shit initiative. But I've had times where I've gone first in initiative as cleric, which that's that could be interesting. Uh, so level represents your overall ability and power. Um, there's class level, character level, and spell levels. Uh, and by the way, let me know too if uh, I do have a thing that happens with Discord too, where if uh, oh gosh, you hear me right? We hear you, Scott. Okay, yeah, just just ping me, ping me if you stop hearing me because there is a thing that happens with my Discord that. I, I, I have to usually notice that people aren't hearing me or I'm not hearing people for it to happen, but just let me know. Um, monsters, um, kind of self-explanatory, that's generally like your enemies. Um, multipliers, uh, mainly that's with like criticals or other things where you have to multiply damage or other things. Uh, NPCs are characters not controlled by uh, the GM, or characters controlled by the GM. And then you have player characters controlled by uh, players, uh, penalties, which uh, are numerical values subtracted from a check or statistical score, uh, rounds, which will be when you're in combat. Um, we have, you basically have everyone will participate in each round of combat. And then once everyone is taken a turn, essentially you move into the next round of combat, uh, starting from the top of initiative. Uh, rounding, uh, usually, uh, unless otherwise stated, you round down in situations where you have decimals as far as Pathfinder. Uh, saving throw, which is um, what you have to make in reaction to a gen dangerous spell or effect, um, whether it be like uh, somebody dominating person on you or uh, a poison or you know doing a reflex save to avoid taking full damage on a fireball uh next up we have skills which are um uh ability to perform an ordinary task such as climbing sneaking diplomatizing uh things along that line like your ability to do things like you know yeah variety of things spell like abilities um Usually, um, spell-like abilities will come from, like, racial abilities or class abilities. Um, it functions like a spell, but it's granted through, like I said, a racial or a class ability. Spell resistance is your ability to resist magic. Uh, some creatures, uh, especially later on at higher levels, will have uh, SR that you will have to overcome if you're trying to cast something on them. Uh, dragons are probably more notorious as far as uh, they tend to have SR on them. Uh, stacking, uh, which is adding bonuses together. Like There's some bonuses that do stack and some that don't. Um, it depends on what kind they are. Like uh, There's luck bonuses and morale bonuses. You can have somebody that gives you a luck-based bonus and somebody who gives you a morale bonus. Um, and those will stack together. But if, like, you have somebody giving you a plus two morale bonus to hit and a plus three morale bonus to hit, you take whatever is higher. They do not stack together because they're the same kind of uh, bonus. Uh, you have supernatural abilities, um, which are magical def attacks, defense, and qualities. Uh, these are active and require a u action to utilize. Um, and then there's turns, which are during combat uh that's when you are able to do your um, standard action movement action and if you have things like swift actions or immediate actions you can also perform those so now i'll get into generating a character so there's six fairly easy steps to creating a character which is determining your ability score picking your race picking your class skills feats equipment and then finishing touches so if you are looking to make a pathfinder society legal character um you will want to do a 20 point buy um if you look down further on that um legacy core rule booking started page uh it does go over generating uh ability scores 
and uh, what the conversion is for buying them. Uh, picking race is self-explanatory. Most races will generally have two things that you'll get a plus on and one thing that you'll get a negative on or it'll be you'll get like one uh, thing that you'll get like a plus two on with no drawbacks. Uh, skills and feats are uh, like I said above what those are. You basically select what you want to put your skill ranks into. Uh, the amount of skills that you're able to do each level is determined by uh, intelligence as well as what class you are. Some classes are a little easier to be a skill monkey with than others. And then with feats, you get one feat at first level, two if you're a first level human, three feats at first level if you are a first level human fighter. Which is why you will, that's, you know, usually one of the more common things for fighter is you'll see human fighters a lot because you get three feats at level one, which allow you to get, you know, fairly progressed into uh, the feat tree uh, as far as being able to get to things later on easier to be able to have really cool and interesting things that you get to do. Um, buying equipment. So if you click that link, um, there's uh, equipment on there. Usually for first level, uh, you'll have enough gold to buy yourself um, some somewhat okay armor, a weapon, whether it be um, a ranged weapon or a melee weapon, um, and then maybe a little bit of gear as well, like some rope, some food, uh, basically things that'll kind of be you know useful equipment that you'll want to have. Um, so I think that's all for me. If anyone has any question, um, oh, you just like listening to these. I'm, I'm just looking kind of in the voice here just to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, DR is the worst mechanic. Oh, you have a green ring. Okay. Dragons should be fought with whips. Okay. Except in uh, Pathfinder, whips are non-lethal. Uh, I mean, not that non-lethal is bad. It's just, it, it's different to do non-lethal versus lethal damage. It, there's so definitely good times. Fixed, so, yeah, there's, there's great feats. To, there's a feat to, take to make you a whip master who can like lethally beat people to death with a whip. Well, so, or as you would say, there's a feat for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so go ahead uh, if you want to go over um, second edition here. And then anyone who's working on a first edition character after he finishes, uh, feel free to ask questions, and I will assist you with any first edition characters that you are building right now. Yep. I was going to dive into character creation for second edition. Second edition is a little bit different. It's a bit more similar to 5e in terms of rules. Uh, you can find them also on another tab of the website that Sky mentioned. So, creating a character. Uh, obviously, first you'll want to come with a concept ahead of time, but I will dive into the first steps. So, uh, point, point by doesn't apply in second edition. You will actually, instead, depending on what options you take with your character, choose uh, what determines how many points get added or taken off from your ability score. So they all start out at 10. So, first step is to decide on an ancestor. What character, which is the new version for race, since they've now separated out race into two things, or two or three things. Ancestry, backgrounds, and um, there's another one. I'm blanking on the name of it. They just added it for alternative. I will show you. Uh, so this will go with the new cool thing that can now play as a goblin free. So we will be making a goblin here. So that already affects our ability score in that we now get a plus two to get. and Charisma. We also get a free one. So since we're, I am, for reasons that will become apparent once I discuss class, we'll go with the addition. 
for the three. But also, being a goblin means that you're not very wise, so you will actually be taking minus two to wisdom. Four. So you can see the modifiers have, have been adjusted there. Right, yeah. Class. So for this, I'll go with something simple and go with fighter. This also affects your ability score, so you can choose either Dexterity or Strength. Now, I'll go with Dexterity, since I can pump that a lot higher. With a Goblin. But with being small, Strength is not going to be quite as important as being able to move around the battlefield. Alright. Next, we have to pick a background. Now, there's a whole list of backgrounds, which I've now headed over to Archives of Nethys. And, as you can see, as I slowly scroll down, there is a lot of backgrounds. Uh, the ones that have a symbol of the Glyph of Road means that they are standard for uh, society play. So you can see, uh, for example, here, this Droskari Disciple is not legal. It is from one of the adventure paths, uh, Fire of the Haunted City. So it is not considered normal material that's suitable for society play. Uh, instead, I guess we will make our Goblin Fighter a Barkey. So you can see here, you you get to choose two ability boosts. One is going to be either Constitution or Charisma, and the other one's free boost. So I'm going to boost our Constitution, and I'm also going to boost our Strength. You can also see here that. So from this, we now have, I believe that's now everything that goes into our ability scores. So this is what our character's final ability scores are going to be. We now determine, move on to... Sorry, I came into this last moment, so I'm doing the best I can. Uh, let's see. We now move on to adding up skills. So, from our class, we are going to need to look up what the class skills you get for a fighter. So that's going to be a trained proficiency in acrobatics or athletics. I'm going to go with acrobatics and you get to choose three additional skills. So I'm going to take diplomacy, deception, and I guess we'll take athletics also. In addition from that background, we also receive a certain number of skills. Oops, sorry, that's why you pay attention to these. Uh, instead of diplomacy, so it doesn't overlap, uh, I'll take intimidation. Diplomacy will be coming from Barky, so you get diplomacy and alcohol floor. So, I fill that in as oh. And I misspelled that. Frank. Alright, you also gain 
this feet. So we want to note that down under feet. Hob, knob. That is a heel feet. All right, so now that we've determined our skills, we now move on to feet. We are only going to get one feet to choose from. There are a ton of different feet. I can bring up the page for that. So here, look at all of these. It doesn't quite matter at first level what you're going to go with. Probably scrolling that a bit too fast for you guys. Just to demonstrate, we have a ton of stuff. Uh, I am going to go with I guess die hard. We are going to be in combat. It's going to make mean that it's going to be harder to kill. Kind of fitting with a the goblin. They're rather resilient, even if they are quite squishy. Of course, there goes me hitting Control S instead of Save. All right. Uh, next step, we're going to determine our starting wealth. I am going to assume <laughs> that this is a society legal character, because normally you would roll for starting wealth. However, in society, you get only fifteen gold. In second edition, they basically. Uh, decimated what the value is to make it seem less absurd that you're carrying around tons upon tons of gold. So from this, you would get more gold. There we go. 15 gold. From that, you can buy a certain amount of equipment. So I am going to pull up some equipment and buy some armor for this here. I'm going to go with a change shirt. That's 5 GP. Now we're 10, but we have a change shirt. And for a weapon, I'm probably just going to give a simple sword there to find it. We have a number of, there's a ton of different weapons. Being a fighter, we have all of these choices, including of martial weapons. I think I'm going to go with Dog Slicer, which is pretty an iconic weapon for goblins. Yeah. <laughs> it's also very, very cheap, so I'm now going to have to deal with the issue of is now nine gold and nine SP silver pieces. And we now have a dog slice. Although one problem that might be with you having a dog slicer is if your character is like a medium though, like isn't dog slicers more made for like goblins at like small size so are well I am more a like well, oh, you are a goblin. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> That's why I made that, that choice. Norm normally, a, go a dog slicer would be an inappropriate weapon for anyone. Like, they're very iconic to goblins. No one else would yeah. trust a rusty, horrible blade like that. <laughs> Alright. So that's nearly everything. We now have to deal with some finishing details. So alignment. Society, you can't be evil. Despite goblins being described as characterized through all of first edition as being a rather chaotic, heavy emphasis on the chaos, but also chaotic evil. 
characters, they are now supposed to be nice and good and lords of the society. So we are actually going to go with chaotic neutral for our alignment. Religion. You don't need to necessarily choose a religion. I'm going to have our character be agnostic since we're a fighter and a goblin and I don't know that they really care about gods. Except, you know, divine beings that might try to eat them. But let's try not to worry about those. So we are nearly done with this character. You next... Uh, so... You next choose various more fluffy things like how old your character is, some backstory and stuff. That doesn't really matter. Uh, in society, you'd next choose what faction you are a part of. There are currently four main factions and two minor factions. I am going to make our character a member of Horizon Hunters. Um, they're a fun faction. They are mainly focused about going out and adventuring rather than being, you know, trying to recruit like how Envoys Alliance is trying to always recruit new members to the society. Grand Archives is more focused on paperwork and serving the hierarchy of the society in Absalon. And the Vigilant Seal are basically new versions of the remainders of goody two-shoe lawful good paladins who didn't die when the society basically suicided everyone on the Whispering Tyrant. So. And let's see, that is it. We now have a fully Pathfinder Society legal character. There are a few other columns that would be filled in here, but those are all minor things. Okay. Would be cool to touch on before people ask like specific type questions. Um, cause a lot of people, you know, don't really know the difference between some of the different games like Pathfinder, Starfinder, and like D&D. &D. How does Pathfinder strictly differ from things like D&D? &D? Like, are there completely different rule sets? Is it just like a completely different style, just with a similar, like, you know, TTRPG okay. style? I, I can clear I, that up. It's that, uh, this, all right, so Pathfinder is originally they were part of the same rule system back in three five days the owners wizards of the coast uh of D, D had something called the open gaming light and that allowed more than just them to make worlds and concepts and adventures and basically build up for a small so only using a certain amount of things that were deemed to be free open source and Pathfinder and Paizo. Paizo was the publisher of one of the largest gaming magazines called Dragon. Mm -hmm. They were a big mainstay of the 1990s and early 2000s D&D world. They had their own world setting. So similar to how D&D has Greyhawk and uh, Forgotten Realms, Eberron, Paizo had their world called Galarian that focused around the Pathfinders, the Avengers Pathfinder Society in the Inner Sea region. Unfortunately, around towards the mid-2000s, Wizards decided that for their new edition, 4th edition, which if people are experienced or remember back in those days or have heard stories, 4th edition is something that's basically not talked about. It was so terrible. Uh, it nearly it is actually part of the reason why Wizards got set back as a company for until the past few years. That caused a lot of outrage, especially since in part of that they decided for fourth edition they were no longer do the open gaming license. So as part of this, Paizo split off, made a fork of three five that they published as their own new um, 
D20 system. So it still uses D20 dice. The rules are almost exactly the same. They changed. The, they switched a few, condensed some of the skills and a few other very minor things that I can't even remember the exact details of how it differs. It's so minor into their own new system called Pathfinder Role Playing Adventure Game. So that's what Pathfinder is. So it's legally it is not D and D. But it is basically D and D, but without the trademarks and intellectual property that are owned by Wizards of the Coast buying it off of the people who bought it off of Gary Guide. So basically, Wizards thinks that they own D and D, so we can't call it D and D. So it's like a kind of spinoff of sorts. Yeah, so it's a bit of a spinoff. They were wildly successful because for first edition, first edition was basically the mainstay for, at least in my opinion, and a lot of people who lived through that time, it was kind of the mainstay for D&D-like play, so colloquial D&D, D20 system, role-playing, tabletop, TTRPG, basically, during the period no. of 4th edition, because no one played 4th edition. It's changed now that 5th edition, 5th edition has been a wild success and has brought Wizards back uh, from the brink of basically having to rely on magic for income. Mm -hmm. The So that's a bit why 2nd edition Pathfinder has come up, that they realized that they've kind of gotten bogged down with 10 years of um, material and source books and stuff, and it was just kind of becoming very, very complex if you owned all the books and had all the options to balance everything. So they wanted to with a fresh start and also be able to update with some new concepts like, you know, I guess, just not to go into the more nitty gritty political stuff of it, but the change from race to ancestry is kind of a needed change in that very set in old sort of concepts. Whereas now most modern systems are moving away from having race be very deterministic about how your character is because mm -hmm. you know that sounds racist <laughs> they, they say that you are goblin because you are chaotic evil and stupid and uncivilized savage it's now you can be a goblin but you could be a goblin who would happen to be raised in a city and is actually a very sophisticated sort of the theater and a intellectual character. Okay. So, but um, I guess you also asked about Starfinder. So Starfinder is another system that created to fill a gap that's kind of been missing in TTRPG, which is a sci-fi TTRPG. It is set among the stars in basically the future. So there's a mysterious event. That, so this is actually chronologically follows the world of Galarian, uh, and which is the world setting for Pathfinder. Uh, I believe it's supposed to be a couple thousand years in the future, at least a thousand years. Uh, but there is a mysterious event called the Gap, during which no one can, no one who lived through that time can remember what happened. They can remember events before the Gap, and they can remember events after the Gap. But there is a period of about like 400 years that are just missing from the galaxy's collective memory. And during that period, it seems that the world of Galarian disappeared, along with a couple gods. Some things got swapped around. And it's the big mystery of the Starfinder setting. What happened during the game? Where did Galarian go? But and then the rest one of the are there. And so basically it has a lot of the same you can play as a lot of the same races and it follows a very similar but slightly different uh version of the rules i probably don't have enough prepared to try to describe the rule set um i know if, if we wanted to discuss expand to that we'd have norse norse is uh pretty much big gm here or in ttrpg mm -hmm. starfinder big norse he world, is yeah. great he has a number of he is like a five star gm so he's great if you want to have a really good game go join one of his games yep uh, the other thing i was going to say too with starfinder is uh one of the more interesting slash neater things about it is it 
involves a it has a system for uh ship to ship combat as well which can be interesting slash stressful slash fun depending on the situation um but yeah it definitely offers a lot more exploration um and variety because you can explore all kinds of worlds uh instead of just being in one world exploring different like regions of that world So, so I was also question. Get, I, was, I, was, I was also to add on, I guess relevant to this furry crowd, Starfinder is great in that they've now shifted in first edition to play non-core races and a couple other ones that they've adopted over the years as being generally available. You need boots, so you'd need to have win, win chronicle sheets or rewards from going to cons, GMing things, to play more obscure races like, say, a cat boat or a. Starfinder has made that, blown that out the window. It is now a galaxy full of all sorts of strange, scaly and furry and wiggly, tentacly alien creatures. So now there is a ton of races to opt, choose from, many of which are furry. Like, I know one of the rewards, unfortunately you need a Chronicle Sheet, but the Chronicle Sheets are a lot easier to get in Starfinder. I'm get a friend to hook me up with his second if he play as he GMs, he gets a copy of it, which he's already gotten. But once he finishes twelve more or twelve games checking off on the sheet, he'll be able to give a free one to me, which I'll be able to now play as an otter in space. Otter folk called Bernari. So but, there's, uh, there's restrictions. Kind of other races. So there's restrictions there are, on races. There are Starfinder so Pathfinder <coughs> Society has restrictions on races. That are a little more strict, and they've realized that those kind of are not quite appreciated. They, they worked well in the early years, but now that there's just tons of material, it's hard. It, it feels wrong for new players to be told that they can't play. They can only play like five of the maybe twenty-five society legal races. In Starfinder, right. you have probably to start off with a well. You, your first character is going to have to be a baseline one but as you play the games different scenarios will open up different racial options for you so it, after you play your first maybe 10 games you'll have a ton of different races you can create for your second character and they are a bunch of different things and the, the idea is basically to make sure that people don't jump in and get confused with more complicated racial options because some of the races can get really weird like one of them is a large size so normal characters take up only one square uh, it's a five foot square you can also have characters that are large such as marlamas which are giant they're large so 10 by 10 so four if they go go a square of four squares and they are large walruses basically just non-anthropomorphic walruses but anyway, to but yeah, I've anyway, sort of like, sidetracked things. <laughs> yeah, and I was gonna say, yeah, those restrictions are only if you're doing society, which is the organized play version of Pathfinder, Starfinder. Um, if you are just wanting to do the RPG version, uh, obviously you can use whatever your GM allows you to, or and whatnot. So. You have a lot more freedom if you want to do the non-organized play. We do understand that, you know, a lot of people are kind of turned off by the organized play uh, strictness of the rules and such. So, like, we are hoping to maybe be out, able to offer more, like, non-society at some point here. I know, yeah, Volpus, I was you were talking gonna... about running some campaign mode stuff. Um yeah, so I'll mention uh, campaign here. mode is an interesting thing that you can do with the modules. Because the modules aren't quite good enough to just play with society legal characters because they're a lot longer. They take a number of different sessions, which could end up locking up your character. Society games are meant to be one shots. So you, you play them for three, four hours, and you're done, and you get your XP, and you can give your you know, spend your credits or gold or whatever on your character for their next mission. The modules take a lot longer. They're more like mini campaigns, so home sort of like home games. Uh, and you can run them in campaign mode, which where you will get credit for a society legal character, but it's like you if you had done a free gen. 
but that works well because I can, as a GM, can set any rule I want. I can make any change I want. So I can let you guys play as any race you want, use strange options that have just been released, that aren't sanctioned yet. And I actually am planning on running a Starfinder game uh, next month, if anyone's interested. So this is assuming you guys are playing, like, when you say organized play, you mean, like, that's, like, the, the strictly legal, you know, form of, of play. Whereas, I'm guessing you have other ways that you can play where it's, like, basically anything goes. Yeah, you can just it's, pick up the so book and make your own home game, but I'll say most activity is done through organized play because it really simplifies a lot of the issues of getting players and GMs and material. The okay. scenarios are pre-written, so I can basically pick up and within a few days be ready to run a game in society, whereas if I were to try to write my own campaign, it would take me at least a month or two before I'd be ready to start game one. Because you gotta make sure you group. have everything organized and... Yeah, because I'd need to write a story, I'd need to come up with different options, I'd need to gather a group up, sort out what they want to play as, adjust the story to deal with the fact that someone's chosen, say, an aquatic race, and... Yeah, <laughs> like, okay. some of the story choices are not gonna work with that. So but yeah, and then, so but society, yeah. they, they pride themselves on the universal table. So GMs are expected to keep things universal so you can take your character. Like One of the things I used to explain it as is that you, if you have a society legal character with a number and you have all your chronicle sheets gathered together in a folder, you could take your, your character and fly to I don't know, outer Mongolia. And if you can find a Pathfinder organized play game there, that GM can look at your chronicle sheet, see that you have a legal character of that level with that much gold and that much equipment, and let you start playing a game immediately. So you take your character from campaign to campaign. It's not like you just make one character for that campaign, and then when that campaign's over, you're no. done. Yeah, no. So it's uh, so there's every there's a few exceptions with quests and uh, modules, the sanctioned modules and stuff. But generally, each each game is. Uh, well, it a different basically takes part. three. Yeah, it basically takes three get normal standard games in both first edition and second edition to level up. Yep, and yeah, and, that, and that's the nice thing is you know you get to you know ver uh, having a campaign where maybe you play like ten tables. Uh, society, you know, you can uh, if you want to get up to the seeker level, which is level what that's 12, 11 12, 12. Yeah, 12th it's, it's, level 12, 12 level and higher is considered seeker and there there yeah. are maybe only five or six scenarios that seeker level they're considered very hard but do crazy cool things like delve into the past of the society and the shadowy December that control it there's 10 people in masks and hidden identity that hide magical helmets that hide their identities completely from scrying and anything so they're super secretive basically the illuminati run the society so there's the question of whether how benevolent they are uh there's also ones where you can like basically go save the world against yeah. like super super powerful threats basically keep like demigods from being summoned I have not yet gotten a level to play a character up enough to play a seeker level Same. stuff. I tend to play characters and get them up to basically high medium level, so about ninth level, and then start a new character. But that's mostly because it can be a bit it can be a bit of a pain to find enough people to do a seeker level game. But anyway, the point I was making was, you know, a camp, you could have like a campaign or a homebrew where maybe you play like 10 games, but getting to like Seeker level and Pathfinder means that you've played at least like 33 uh, tables or up to 33 tables worth of uh, gameplay. Uh, but depending on whether you run modules or other things that uh, give you XP a little quicker uh, than just the standard one table, one XP. But yeah. Um, and that's the nice thing that is uh, fun about society as far as being able to have your characters. And I was going to say, too, considering um, we're getting a little low for time here, too, uh, I wanted to plug quickly as well that I do have a Pathfinder Society 
uh, quest table that could use some players later on today. It's called Honor's Echo. Uh, if you guys would like to sign up for that, I will. it will be running at, I believe it's 4 o'clock. Well, 4 o'clock East, uh, 4 o'clock Standard Time. Uh, it runs it's 4 at... 4 o'clock for you. It's 5, five o'clock. 5 Eastern. o'clock. Yeah, so 5 o'clock Eastern, Central 4 o'clock five. Central. Yeah. And that'll be the last uh, organized play table of the weekend as far as the convention goes. Um, otherwise, if you're ever interested in uh, tabletop, uh, tabletop directory, we will have uh, games listed in there, whether it be um, organized play or just um, tables that are, you know, being run by our other GMs or people who just want to do, you know, fun tables, homebrew and whatnot. Uh, like Volpus uh, said, he'll be doing his uh, campaign mode table there, and that'll be obviously put up on directory. Um, so feel free to stop by there. Uh, for organized play, we do try to run at least a couple tables a week. I personally uh, run Pathfinder 1. Big Norse Wolf generally runs uh, Starfinder Society. So most for the most part, we should have like two tables a week that will run uh we will be taking this next week off uh to recover from the convention but after plus, that plus hopefully I'm, uh, plus i'm at gen con so yeah like, plus, there's gen, busy next plus there's week. Yeah, gen con I mean, happening it, it, it's good stuff it builds experience and stuff but yeah gen con's a big deal for if, if anyone's familiar with gen con it's basically the mecca for ttrpg yeah uh the big ones for uh, as far as Paizo products go is Gen Con and Paizo Con. Uh, yeah. Those are the two big conventions that happen. Uh, uh, Origins so also when it happens. Horrible. Yeah. Which actually Paizo yeah. actually took over Origins this year for the virtual con after they collapsed. We actually had a lot of fun. I, I GM'd uh, a bit at uh, Concurrent, which was Paizo's basically replacement for Gen or, sorry, or Origins. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, here, so we only have a couple minutes left. Does anyone have any questions uh, regarding their characters? I did ask in the uh, first on voice as well as on Twitch here. So please, if you have any questions, um, Feel free to ask. Otherwise, if you are not, uh, if your question happens after this panel has ended, uh, feel free to ask in TTRPG General. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any of your questions there as well. Or if you're watching this video uh, afterwards, uh, you can come over to the TTRPG section and ask any questions that you'd like over in TTRPG General. Absolutely, and anyone, make sure that once since you attended this panel, be sure to run that attend command in that channel so you guys get your tokens. Every token is an entry into the drawing at the end of the at the end of the, the con. So don't forget, we're giving away over one uh, one thousand dollars worth of prizes in this uh, in this raffle. So don't miss out on your chance. We have some Steam games, we have some uh, Fury Valley related stuff. It's it, it's all we got a lot of prizes, guys. <laughs> Alrighty, so um, the next panel we're going to be running into again before I before I go this say this, uh, Strider did mention that they are running another panel or not a panel another uh, Pathfinder game. What time did you say that was at? Five. Five o'clock Eastern. Five p.m. Eastern. So if you guys want to participate in that, if you do not already have the TTRPG roll, go to Welcome and Rolls. Is it's above it's above this chat? No, it's below this chat. And assign <laughs> yourself the TTRPG roll. That way you guys can go play. Um, seems like you know it's pretty simple to get started so if you have any questions make sure you let them know because they need they need some players guys it'll be fun um actually do you mind if i put the warhorn link in not at all voice? go for it all right all righty so the next uh panel that we're going to be doing is going to be hosted by uh max taylor and myself it is going to be discussing um Basically, like, multiplayer games versus single-player games. So, like, single-player games in a world basically filled with multiplayer games and how they're still staying relevant. Do your thing. Do your thing.